So let's uh, walk through uh, the pipes of an air conditioner to see what a refrigerant does. The refrigerant is the uh, magic fluid inside an air conditioner. So here we have a nice little drawing of, of a window air conditioner and sort of the mechanical components in it. Uh, how many of you have ever taken the cover off a room air conditioner and looked inside? No. <laughs> well, quite a few. I, I did. Uh, mine uh, rusted out, and uh, even though the, the outside was totally rusted out and useless, the, the inside was uh, still in perfect mechanical condition after 20 years. Uh, let's, let's follow the refrigerant. It's the magic fluid inside uh, an air conditioner as it goes through the refrigeration cycle. Uh, let's start here. Uh, the refrigerant, it's a gas. It's a cool, low-pressure gas, which is sucked into a compressor. Here we have a compressor here with a piston and, and a crankshaft and valves. And it's compressing this up to a high pressure. And as it is compressed to a high pressure, it becomes hot. A good old thermodynamics class. Um, this high, hot, high-pressure gas is ideal for releasing its heat to the outdoor air. And it passes through a heat exchanger known as a condenser where it does release its heat to the outdoor air which is blown past it, past the tubes, and at the outlet of the condenser it is a warm high pressure liquid. It then passes through a capillary, a very long, very thin uh, tube or it could be an ex expansion valve, uh, and at the outlet of the capillary there's a sudden release of pressure. This the pressure suddenly drops and the, the, this, uh, hot, uh, this warm high pressure liquid becomes a boiling mixture of a liquid and gas at a very cold temperature, a source of cold for, for cooling the building. And this cold low pressure boiling liquid and gas sent through an evaporator, another heat exchanger where room air is blown over it, it gives up its cold to the room air and emerges once again as a cool low pressure gas. So it's important to consider these uh, uh, stages when looking at what a refrigerant is and what it should be doing. Um, here's a schematic, very simple, uh, the compressor. Uh, if you look at the compressor in the schematic, uh, we don't see the piston, uh, we don't see the, uh, the motor. It's all mysteriously hidden in a, in a canister. And I'll talk about that some more in a few minutes. Uh, and I hope you can see the components as you go through here. Now, the fluid, the magic fluid that goes through this cycle, the refrigerant, What's a good refrigerant? It, it must have good thermodynamic properties, it must boil and condense at the desired temperatures and acceptable pressures, and it must have a high heat of vaporization. That's the uh, uh, kilojoules per, of heat that will uh, vaporize one kilogram of refrigerant or, or given off by uh, one kilogram as it, it, it uh, condenses. Now there are other desirable properties for a refrigerant. If people are going to use it, it should be non-toxic uh, non-flammable and non-corrosive and for years it was very difficult to find uh, refrigerants that, that met this, uh, these conditions and it should not damage the natural environment. You notice I put this uh, criteria in the uh, uh, faint uh, writing. The uh, original uh, refrigerants, uh, nobody knew how to measure the, the effect on the natural environment, the long-term effect. So it's not surprising that the uh, the original refrigerants uh, uh, turn out to have some uh, bad environmental effects that were, really were not known in the past. Um, back to the early history of refrigeration, um, the old refrigerators, uh, I think there were about 100,000 of these in, in Canada in, uh, in the 1930s, and that's really not that much. Uh, they were very uh, difficult uh, and they required a lot of maintenance. The refrigerants that they used were uh, ammonia, sulfur dioxide, methyl chloride, or, or propane, or, or other refrigerants, and th these were good thermodynamically, but uh, they had some real serious problems. They were toxic, uh, corrosive, flammable. Uh, I don't know whether there were any people killed by them, but it, it, it wouldn't be uh, out of the uh, realm of reality. Uh, so refrigeration was rather limited until the invention of, of better refrigerants. It was basically a an industrial process that required constant supervision. The big breakthrough in refrigeration was uh, CFCs, which were invented uh, at the end of the 1920s and started to be used in the 1930s. These were a miracle. 
Uh, here's one of them. It's uh, dichlorodifluoromethane, or uh, CCL2F2, or it's uh, industrial names Freon-12, or CFC-12. And it was the first uh, <coughs> uh, CFC refrigerant that was invented. And it was ideal. It had good thermodynamic properties. It's non-toxic. It's non-flammable. It's non-corrosive. It was, it was an excellent refrigerant. <coughs> And being non-corrosive, uh, it uh, was able to uh, change the, the, the size and shape of refrigerators. Let's compare an ammonia refrigerant with the CFC refrigerant. Uh, using ammonia as a refrigerant, and it's still used uh, industrially, and um, uh, it's used in um, many, well, many, many of our uh, communities in Canada. We have hockey arenas, uh, you have to tell our US visitor that with um, refrigeration plants, they're usually ammonia. But they have uh, uh, sta stationary engineers to uh, supervise the equipment. Uh, if you look at this ammonia compressor, uh, it, the power to compress the ammonia is driven from an electric motor which is outside the ammonia and transmits its power to the compressor through a rotating shaft. Uh, there is a, a shaft seal to stop the ammonia from leaking out but that shaft seal is not perfect. And if you go near an ammonia refrigeration system, you will uh, detect the odor of ammonia. And it requires a lot of supervision and maintenance. You have to top up the ammonia at regular intervals. So this is clearly an industrial process. Okay. The invention of CFC refrigerants, a refrigerant that does not corrode metals, so it could be located inside the refrigerant channels. So all of a sudden we have a hermetic compressor the, uh, the, the compressor, the motor, the wiring for the motor, all the compressor parts are located inside the compressor in a hermetically sealed enclosure. It doesn't leak and there's minimal maintenance. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen uh, air conditioners like the one I had, it was 20 years old, the steel box rusted out, but the internal components were still in good working condition. They were hermetically sealed, nothing came in, nothing came out except the uh, electric power, which was easy to seal. And this had a huge effect on, on, on air conditioning and refrigeration. Uh, an industrial process became a home appliance. And this was in the 1930s. And, and this, it, it's, it was um, a disruptive technology. It wasn't just um, a, a change in the industry or, or the, the uh, mach machinery. This actually changed the history of the world. And maybe that's a bold thing to say. Um, an average homeowner could buy an air conditioner in a store, take it home, put it on the windowsill, install it with those special skills, and it kept the house cool. And this had a huge effect on, on, on where people lived. And, uh, in uh, the United States, uh, people started to move south. It changed the, uh, the, the political landscape of the United States and the economic landscape. Um, and here's some uh, evidence of it. Uh, uh, the populations of the Sun Belt states of Florida, Arizona, and Nevada increased by 3,800%, 5,600%, and 6,900% respectively between 1900 and 2015. And that compares to about 700% for the U.S. as a whole. So just imagine uh, Nevada without air conditioning, without low-cost, convenient, safe air conditioning. Uh, it became a, a, a major uh, disruptive change in, in the society in the United States, and it's, it's still going on in other countries. Uh, it's changing the history and geography of many developing nations, including India, China, Brazil, South Africa, Mexico, Nigeria. Well, this goes on. The, world, uh, the International Energy Agency forecasts that air conditioning energy consumption worldwide in 2050 will be six times what it was in 1990. So this is growing, and it's because of convenient, low-cost air conditioning. And now, the honeymoon ends. Uh, this perfect fluid for, this perfect refrigerant for our air conditioners, not so perfect. In the 1970s, there were concerns about damage to the Earth's ozone layer. Uh, 1989 Montreal Protocol, uh, uh, which Canada and many other countries signed, it, it imposed the phase down of CFCs like the molecule I showed you, and later the phase down of HCFCs, which were slightly different, but 
almost as uh, damaging to the ozone layer. And ultimately, the replacement by HFCs. These are all uh, refrigerants. There may be 100. And if you're interested in the list, you can look in the ASHRAE handbook of fundamentals. Uh, so then I'll plug for one of our <laughs> co-sponsors. It's in the uh, <coughs> libraries, or you can join the organization. Um, in the 2000 to 2016 uh, era, mm -hmm. were concerns about climate change and greenhouse gases, and scientists uh, showed that uh, HFCs themselves were, were uh, powerful greenhouse gas, uh, uh, damaging uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, greenhouse layer of the Earth, uh, and ultimately the Kigali Amendment in October 2016 imposing the phase down of HFCs. Now at this point I'm going to stop talking because I'm not an a, a expert on uh, the phase down of HFCs. Instead we have a real expert. <laughs> Nancy Seymour is uh, the head of the Ozone Protection 